Trucking across America takes me to some of the absolute weirdest stops. Podunk stations and rest areas are easily the strangest. And give me the security of a metro area any day of the week. Bare minimum, the pay's good. I can't vouch for others in the business, but sometimes it just so happens that I'll blink tired and miss a sign on the freeway and drive ahead in the dark night, trying to figure out exactly what my GPS is trying to tell me. Rubbing my eyes, maybe I'll see a place just up ahead that is a space to park for a few hours. Maybe a bed in the rear of my cab is a godsend. No roach-infested rooms for me. I rolled out of South Dakota on the I-90 and passed Beaver Creek into Minnesota. Beyond that, I couldn't tell where I was when my eyes got all fuzzy. The GPS froze up trying to recalculate. Road people talk about the black dog. That little shadow thing that jumps in front of the engine when you get dog tired. Huh, is that where it comes from? But that night at least, he was nowhere to be seen. I glanced over to the pile of empty plastic one-shot energy bottles resting haphazardly on the passenger seat. They were supposed to keep me awake, but they had long lost their potency on me. Squinting ahead, watching the headlights cut the path, I rolled my window down to let the cool air in. Maybe that would help. Wind burst through the cabin and I rubbed my face. That's when I caught sight of a truck stop advertisement. It seemed like my best bet to catch a couple winks before I got back on the road. Maybe I could even get something to eat. I pulled up the ramp and took the bridge hanging over the freeway towards that dull lit sign that called like heaven. I kicked out of the cab, stretching while tugging my waistband out from the places that it dug. It felt good. Standing in the big lot, I read the establishment sign. End of the road. It felt cold looking up at that sign leveled on two poles. I shivered and withdrew my jacket from the cab before slamming the door shut. The lot was nearly empty. The only vehicles besides mine was a pair of old cars parked around back that I assumed belonged to the employees working the owl shaft. As I crossed the asphalt, I caught a glimpse of a woman standing in the wide center window of the dining area and then the blinds came down to hide her. A chill crawled down the back of my neck, so I threw up the collar of my jacket, blaming it on the night air. This is the part where I should have taken my dear old dead dad's wisdom. You would say, Bert, if it feels like a setup, it's a setup. Of course, he died in jail though. Pushing through the glass door, I was immediately met by the warmth and the smell of waffle batter cooking as the noise of a jukebox in the far corner played, cover of a rolling stone. Lining the kitchen's wall was a counter with red-high stools. I took the one nearest to the exit, peering in through the order window to see if I could see the cook. A waitress, a young woman with blue eyes, black curls, and a khaki brown uniform greeted me with a quick smile as she handed me one of these single-paged, laminated menus. Her name tag said, Betty. What can I get ya? I put the menu under my elbows. Bacon and eggs and some decaf. Can do. She moved to the coffee pot behind the counter and poured me a cup before moving to the kitchen. Holding the ceramic cup in my hands, I tapped my foot along to the old song coming from the jukebox. The place is pretty empty. I called through the open hole beyond the counter. She poked her head in through the rectangle opening, shooting me another smile before scanning the main room. Is it? She said. I glanced over my shoulder. All the booths were empty and all the tables too. What could she have possibly meant? Not knowing how to respond, I took a sip. She giggled and ducked out of view. Examining the memorabilia hanging on the walls, I was immediately struck by how out of place things felt. On the wall by the jukebox was a poster promoting Reagan's 1980 campaign, still as pristine as ever. Then there was, right by the door that I had entered, a blocky cigarette vending machine. I blinked. The kitchen door swung open, forcing a jump out of me and Betty delicately placed the white plate on the counter while I wasn't looking. I pointed to the cigarette machine. 
Those things are illegal, aren't they? My eyes stayed glued to the object. She shot me a funny look. I swallowed hard and shifted around so as to not look at the vending machine. And then a sick fist twisted my entrails around and my fingers gripped the counter. I wanted to scream but it wouldn't come out. I stared down at the plate, catching the four bacon slices in a floaty, oozy, orange pool, a pile of veiny chicken embryos. Betty rounded the corner. Are you alright? I pushed the plate away. There's something wrong with these eggs. She examined the plate. What? What's the matter with them? Was she messing with me? Those are fertilized. She lifted my fork, prodding one of the embryos with a corner prong. Blood sprang and collected in the edges of the plate. God, no, don't do that. I swatted her hand away as the fork fell onto the floor with a sharp metallic clatter. She squinted and then pursed her lips. Sir, don't touch me like that. Uh, sorry. I glanced to the mess on the plate and tore a napkin from a nearby dispenser to cover it. What's wrong with those eggs? She took a step away from me. There's nothing wrong with them, sir. What do you mean? Did you not see that blood? Her eyes darted around the diner, flustered, cheeks red. You're starting to make the other customers uncomfortable. Please. A chill swept clear through my jacket till I couldn't feel my fingers or toes. Then heat washed down my body. I spun on the stool, looking around in all directions. What are you talking about? There's nobody else here. She leaned in very close, too close, and whispered, Is there someone that I need to call for you? Are you? She tapped the side of her temple with an index finger. All there? This enraged me, but still there was that lingering feeling that I wasn't seeing all to be seen. I shouted, I'm not crazy, lady. A thud came from the kitchen, followed by rattling chains. I gripped the countertop again and white knuckled. Betty shook her head, throwing up her hands. Oh, now you've done it. You've woken him up. What? You heard me. As she moved to the kitchen to push the door in, she stopped midway through the threshold. I could hear the rattling of the chains clearer thumping and breathing and scraping nails. I'll have your bill just as soon as I put him back to sleep. Removing my hands from the counter, I saw that I had left behind nail marks. My hands shook as I withdrew my wallet. Fumbling with my debit card, I waited and listened. Suddenly, I was struck with the idea that I might die there if I weren't to leave immediately. Betty from somewhere in the rear of the kitchen spoke. No, no, you can't see the gas. Shh, shh. If you don't go back to sleep, I'll cut you. I pulled my jacket tighter around as she returned. Not a noise came from the kitchen. The dizzying effects of surrealism were in full force. Whoa there, fancy pants. She out of my debit card. We don't accept these. I threw a 20 on the counter and snapped the card from her hand. All right, I'll be going then. What about your change? She popped the bill straight while holding it up to the overhead light. Hold on. Heart pounding onto my chest, I spun around with my arm still holding the glass door open. Yes? What is this, some joke money? What do you mean? It's fake. Says that it was printed in 2013. I shrugged. More than anything, I just wanted to get out of that place. I was certain that I would die. It's all I got. She rolled her eyes. Fine, just go then and don't come back. I don't intend to. I ran as fast as I could to my rig, swung out the door and I dove in, scrambling to slam it shut again. Sitting in the driver's seat, I chewed my tongue. That was not normal. Something told me that if I spent a moment longer in that place, something terrible was going to happen to me. Intuition. Or my dad's words, maybe. If it feels like a setup, it's a setup. I double and triple checked to make sure the doors of the cab were locked and I tried bedding down and back. 
but try as I might, I could not shake the feeling that I heard the distinct tapping of footsteps outside. And then, of course, I would peer out the windows, but all that was there to greet me was long, still shadows. There, across the lot, sat the diner with its warm yellow glow, seeping out through blinds onto the asphalt. My mind raced all night as I tried closing my eyes in bed. As tired as I had been coming to the place, my adrenaline wouldn't afford rest. The cabin felt muggy, wrong. I waited and waited and waited until a gentle sunlight spilled in and I gave up on sleep. Moving to the driver's seat, I cranked the engine alive. And that's when I noticed it. The truck stop sign was no longer lit up. In fact, there was no sign whatsoever. And the windows of the old place were covered in plywood board. And tiles dangled like tongues from its ancient roof on loose nails. I pulled out fast and hit the freeway knowing only that I needed to go east and away from there. It comes as no surprise to me that the open road has tricks of plenty harbored around every dark corner of America. Many of the guys that have been trekking far longer than me tell some of the wildest stories. Tales of the black dog come to life, or even psychos trying to run drivers off the road in desolate, otherwise quiet stretches. Then there is one of the things that truckers are known for even if we don't like it. Well, that would be lot lizards. Women and men of the night that hang around truck stops, hoping to shack up with the driver. Although their reputation is skewed toward unscrupulous, due to some of them being addicts, the majority of the ones that I've met have been relatively nice. People just trying to make their way in this crazy world. For every outrageous story you hear about a toothless granny busting somebody's windows with a tire iron, there are at least two dozen or more of them who are scared and penniless and far from home. I ran into an outlier among them. On my way down I-25 southbound through Colorado, I saw the sign for a Love's gas station near Berthed and decided it would be a good to stretch my legs one last time before the home stretch to Santa Fe. With still a few hours of sunlight left, I could refuel, catch an early dinner and maybe a shower before I kept on keeping on. The parking lot was slam packed with cars and trucks alike. I couldn't wait to fill my growling stomach, even if it was with some BS like hamburger steak. I moseyed up to the door after topping the tank with my cart at the pump. With my spare clothes slung over a shoulder, I pushed in through the door and was greeted by stock rock music coming from the overhead speakers as the man behind the counter nodded to me. After showering, I returned to the general store area and could see through the glass divider that their restaurant was full. I opted to buy a handful of jerky and chips and energy drinks instead. Once I had brought my items to the counter, the clerk rang it up, beeping each one slowly, robotically. Reaching for my wallet, I asked, What's the damage? Dead-eyed, he shifted his gaze from the register to me, then pushed his Bronco's cap back to expose his furrowed brow. Why are you always on the road? Huh? Why are you always on the road? We hate it when you're gone. We hate it and we miss you. Goosebumps sprang across my arms and my stomach fell into my feet. I'm sorry, Chief. Have we met? The clerk blinked a few times, shaking his head. His eyes returned to the register. Uh, that'll be 2568. What did you say? I could feel my knees going weak as I stood there at the counter. I glanced over my shoulder to make sure that no one else was standing behind me and then looked back to the clerk. What did you say? He gave me a meager, confused smile. That'll be $25.68. No, what did you say to me before? I'm sorry, I'm confused. Maybe I was tired. Yeah, that must have been the culprit. I was starting to hear things that weren't there. The thought of taking a vacation came to mind. Lord knows it had been too long since I had had a nice long vacation. Perhaps I could take a cruise south of the border ease my mind, drink tequila, and forget. I paid him and I left. As I walked across the parking lot towards my rig, 
I had already torn into one of the bags of salt and vinegar chips, shoveling a fist of them into my mouth. Probably more than anything else, my sedentary lifestyle combined with the fact that I ate garbage was beginning to fatigue me. And that's when I saw her. Blonde hair, black cowboy hat, blue jean bell bottoms. I stopped mid-step, potato chips crumbling out of my frozen hand. The audacity of this woman struck me first. There she was, leaning against the right headlight of my rig. Her eyes cut through me. How was it that she looked exactly like somebody I already knew? She might as well have been a doppelganger. But upon examining her face, I noticed that she had a disgusting brown birthmark the size of a nickel on her otherwise milk-white chin. Stunning. Hey there, she said. Her lips shot me a kiss. The plastic bag full of snacks and drinks that I was carrying I had torn straight through and I watched as a Red Bull bounced under the front tire of the rig. She laughed at me as I went chasing after them. You've got a bed in this thing, don't you? Scooping as many of the things that had fallen as I could against my chest, I tried ignoring her. Oh, what's the matter, cowboy? She asked. Not interested, I said. Interested in what exactly? I don't like paying for it. I know what you're here for and I don't have an issue with your line of work, but I personally don't involve myself with it. She laughed. Oh, what's that supposed to mean? What exactly do you think my line of work is? You're paid to win. She pulled her expression into one of mock offense. Oh, don't be that way. And then her hands came up in flat palms and one of her pointed boots kicked off the front of my rig, leaving behind a dark streak. All right, you caught me. She rubbed her arms. It sure is cold out here, though. Do you think that I could warm up in your truck for a few minutes at least? I frowned. Why don't you just go up to the store? They don't like me in there. Sighing, I pointed a finger at her. All right, but only for a couple of minutes. I need to go on soon. Maybe it was because she was pretty. Maybe it was because her face was so familiar. I'm uncertain why I cracked open the door and let her crawl inside. I stared down at my bag of open chips, eating one at a time. Where are you headed? South. What for? Stuff. What's your name? Bert. That's interesting. My name's Alex and it's nice to meet you, Bert. Is that short for something else? Bertrand. You are probably the world's worst conversationalist. I'm not an animal, you know. Setting the chips to the side, I nodded. Yeah, I know you're not. I'm sorry. That's better. Now, why don't you tell me why you look at me like that? Like what? Like you've seen me before. Uh, I started. You remind me of someone. Who? My ex. Oh, that's rough. I'm sorry. What made you get into the business? I asked, hoping to change the subject. Well, that's not something I'm asked very often. Her deep brown eyes looked off through the windshield. It's nothing tragic if that's what you think. That's what everybody thinks. I guess so. It's just a way of doing something till I die. Same reason you drive this truck. Same reason scientists watch the stars. Passing the time. Never thought that I would meet a philosophical hooker. Hey, don't call me that. Sorry. The cabin grew quiet and still as her left hand played with one of the holes in her blue jeans where the threads had come away in stringy clumps. She rolled them back and forth between her forefinger and thumb. Oh, why are you always on the road? Well, I tried thinking of a way to explain it. A way to reinforce all the reasons. We get really sad when you're gone. And you're always gone for so long. I blinked and her eyes became tethered. Hers milky, unclear. I sat there with my hands in my lap for an eternity, looking at the woman and nothing else. The world beyond disappeared. A sneaky paranoia coiled around me and squeezed. My fingers latched onto the steering wheel, running the circumference of it nervously. What? What did you say to me? 
You're always gone and it hurts and it hurts to see you gone so long. And you're always tired. Why do you do it? Why do you hate us? Do you not miss your family? Please come back and visit, please, it hurts. The woman reached out with clawed hands and I put up my own to defend myself. She screamed and grunted and grabbed a hold of my throat, pushing my head against the driver's window. Fear welling up in my stomach, I tried to speak but nothing came out. In those moments, I was sure that this woman was going to stick me with a blade and then rob me. Her icy cold fingers dug into my throat, pushing deeper into the soft tissue beneath my jaw, until I heard a pop and a sensation of my own warm blood roll down my chest. I was gurgling and gasping for breath. Her nose was the first to go. Like hot candle wax, her face drooled off her head and dripped onto mine. I blinked sporadically through the melting face as my eyes gunked. And then I was screaming, or perhaps it was a death rattle. In a blink, I was completely alone in the cabin. My scream filled the space as I flailed my arms madly around. It was fully dark outside. Only the love sign illuminated the gray parking lot. God! I wiped my eyes and flipped the sun visor down to investigate my neck. No bruising, no blood, and nothing. Through heart-pounding seconds, I was sure that I had lost my mind. But as I cranked the engine on, I looked over to the passenger seat. There sat a black cowboy hat. I tossed it out the window once I hit the interstate and watched it cyclone around the edge of the trailer in the rear view. Home was just up the way while Don came to meet my wandering mind. Driving for long distances gives you a lot to think about. I wonder about the reasons for life and the whys behind people's actions. But mostly I have thought so inconsequential and difficult that they could hardly be summed up here in words. I dropped my load off in Santa Fe and made my way over to Villanueva, a small community in the heart of New Mexico. Everything on the back roads was quiet as I took the dirt out to where my house stood among dusty hills and sagebrush. This was the place that my ex had wanted. When we were looking to buy a house, I wanted something closer to Albuquerque, but she insisted the price was better and she liked the outdoors. Well, there was plenty of that. Finally, I parked the rig with the engine still running and stared at the dark house with its blue paneling. There had once been a reason for me to get excited about it, but that seemed like a lifetime ago. She never could get over it. As I watched, the black windows caught in the headlights. The CB came alive with static. I froze and watched the black box. Words came through the speakers in sporadic sputters. You don't want to go in, do you? You wish you could turn around and drive off. You don't want to check the mail and see the letters that you've gotten since last you were here. What's the matter with you? Don't you want to be a functioning person? The CB sat quiet and all that could be heard beyond the windows of the cab was the echoing howl of a coyote. Even with AC on the cab, it was warm. I lifted the CB. Who is this? Who's using the channel? A cackle escaped the box, filling me with a sense of impending doom. Dad, don't you recognize my voice? The receiver fell from my hand, stretching the curly cord long. I know you weren't around much, but you would think that you would recognize your son's voice. I rubbed my cheeks. It wasn't happening. It was no more than a manifestation of grief or a sick joke. What are you running from, Dad? Don't you miss? I shut the CB off and pushed open the door to hop out. With the sun cresting the horizon and the overgrowth around my house, I felt cast from any civilized place. A part of me thought perhaps that it had been my ex's plan all along. She would get me out into the middle of the country and slowly drive me crazy. That's cruel and only half true of me to say. I understand that she had her reasons. Believe me, she was a person that refused to take a back seat, and I should have seen that in the beginning. I had the wrong idea about getting married. 
Seeing that the mailbox screwed to the side of the house was flipped partway open with white envelopes protruding out, I chewed my tongue. But ultimately, I tore them from the box to carry inside. The screen door was unlatched and I pushed in through the solid metal door into the cold house. Looking over the envelopes, I saw that she had sent the papers again. I wouldn't sign them. Not because I didn't want to set her free, but I think because I couldn't set myself free. Stupid. After rummaging through the empty fridge, I opted to find a pack of ramen in the cabinet. Once I had cobbled together a jailhouse burrito, I tossed the mail in the trash and I tried watching something on the TV. My eyes didn't stay open for long and before I knew it, I was dreaming. The images came watery and the sounds echoing. She stood in the living room pointing a finger at me, telling me that I hardly knew our son, telling me that I should have been around more. I tried telling her that everything would be better once I quit and sold the rig. We could be a happy, proper family once I had done that. But that never happened. And my son got a bad fever while I was on the road. I tried rushing back, but his body was cold when I finally showed up. The last thing that I remember before I snapped awake was his grave in Villanueva Cemetery. I would go there sometimes after, but she never could. Dark, cold sweating and sore from sleeping in an awkward position on the couch. I tried putting the dream out of my mind. There was no reason to dwell on the past, only the future. Midday light splashed into the house as I went to the window near the TV to swipe open the curtains. It splintered through the glass, forcing me to squint and making me wish that I could live in a world devoid of it. And then there was a knock on the door. I answered it to expose the sharp-dressed gentleman standing on my porch. He removed the spectacles from his face and polished them against a handkerchief. Ah, uh, hello, he said, before returning the glasses across his sharp hooked nose. It's good to see that you're home. I have something of a proposition for you, if you would be so inclined. I would like to hire somebody with your set of skills to take some cargo up to Maine. Where it is is that you own a truck, yes. My mind went to the message that I had received in the CB. Was there any connection? Or had I lost my marbles completely? Who the heck are you? Looking past his shoulder, I could see that there was a woman standing out near a black town car in my driveway, parked behind the rig. Sunglasses and a sun hat disallowed me from making out any defining characteristics of her. Of course, I'm a businessman of sorts, looking to expand to more lucrative ventures. His voice was absent, feeling scripted. There was something in the way that he carried himself that made my skin crawl. My mind immediately went back to the adage that my dad had told me. If it feels like a setup, it's a setup. I get lost. I went to close the door. Hold on. His foot shot into the threshold to keep me from shutting him out. I think I've got something that might change your mind. The man produced a rectangle of paper from his jacket pocket and slipped it to me. Holding it up, I saw that it was a check. Scrawled across the amount line was more than I made in two years of freelance work. Is this some kind of joke? The man raised an eyebrow. Is it not sufficient? I like to take care of my people. You want me to deliver something to Maine? I asked. He nodded. Well, that's right, yes. I understand that you're a timely driver and you live near the pickup location. And more important than anything else, you know there's more in this world than what others are willing to admit. I think you're a prime candidate. Who are you? Without me even realizing it, I gently let the door sway open a few inches. Henry. He put out his hand for a shake and I took it, totally hypnotized by his abnormal demeanor, barely registering how cold his skinny long fingers were. But seeing as you're going to be on my payroll, I would like it very much if you would call me Mr. Calgary. I am preferential to hierarchies and where people belong in them. I hope you understand. Okay. The check felt heavy. 
he clapped his hands together and grinned. It's so nice to meet you at last, Bertrand. So, it was that that I found myself on my way to pick up a shipment in Santa Rosa. The GPS worked well enough to get me in the vicinity of the pickup, but beyond that I was forced to read over the scratchy directions that Calgary had given me. It was early morning as I pulled up to the warehouse buildings bordered by high fencing and barbed wire. At the booth, a guarding a mechanical arm was a man. I could see that he was an older gentleman with a cigarette hanging loosely from his lips as he rounded at the front of my rig, looked at my plate and then pointed me in. In the empty, concrete square, it took no time at all to spot Calgary waving me down from the corner of a long tubular metal building. Pulling the rig around, I caught sight of a single trailer and rolled my window down. Is that the one? Do you see any others? He asked. Rolling the window up again, I muttered to myself, All right, tough guy. Once I had lined myself up with the trailer, I hopped from the cab and walked over to Calgary, standing alongside the trailer. What am I moving? I said. Don't worry about that, there's no reason for it. It will do no good to speculate over things that don't concern you. I bit my tongue. My dad's words rang in my mind again. Something was wrong with this, but the money was the only thing keeping me on the line. You'll be taking this. He tapped the side of the metal container with his knuckles. Up to Bar Harbor. Have you ever had the pleasure of visiting New England? Nope. Oh, that's a shame. Looking over his watch, he went on. Well, it's about time for you to hit the road, Jack. That's the sort of lingo that you fellows use, isn't it? Sure. All right, then I will see you in Bar Harbor when you arrive. He handed me a slip of paper and meet me at this address. If it feels like a setup, then it's a setup. Taking the I-40 east, I tried calming my nerves with the radio, but it could not be helped. I was too stuck in my own head to do anything about it. When I had asked if I could take a look in the trailer, he told me plainly no. There was a lock on the door and if I were to guess, I would say he probably carried the only key. Crossing over the Texas panhandle was something that I hadn't done in years. As I caught the big A skyline, worried whispers crept up in the back of my neck into my ear, making me question if I would ever be further west than that ever again. I was being silly. The thought of that vacation came back, surely with the money that I would get from this haul, I would be able to take a nice long one. A voice came over the CB just as I was passing by Shamrock and my heart froze. For the briefest of moments, I thought the voice was going to hand over some earth-shattering absolutes. But it was just a fellow highwayman. A whole mess of full-grown bears blew my doors off headed west down I-40 past Beninine. I believe it's at 1042 just up the way. Anyone headed east expect a brake check. They had a meat wagon in tow. I lifted the receiver. 10-4, good buddy. As prophesied, the traffic came to a halt. Hoping to catch 169 before the crash site, I hung in the right lane. Minutes went by with the cars ahead inching. That's when it started to rain. Catching sight of the stadies clumped out there near that three-car pileup, I did not envy them with their bright yellow ponchos in the downpour. There in the median was a sheet covering mounds. I knew what that meant. I looked ahead, twisting the radio loud and blotting out the rain with John Prine's voice. Just as it had slowed, it picked up again. The rain came down hard as the sky lit and then belted in protest. I felt a tickly and slither up my right ear but thought that it was only death in the air that had spooked me. I rubbed the dangly flesh there between fingers to scratch the edge. And then it came again and in the dim reflection of the windshield, I caught sight of a man standing behind my chair, towering over me. Initially, his eyes rolled around confused, but I stayed frozen to the steering wheel, not taking my eyes off the road. That man was dead. Lodged into his right cheek was a smattering of broken glass while his left eye hung clear off his face from an optic nerve. Hanging from around his purple swollen throat was a seatbelt. More than anything, I wanted to scream. 
I wanted to slam on the brakes. He reached out to touch my ear again, but this time I tried my best to pay him no mind. An icy rod shot through my whole body as I watched his hand pass through my head. Looking at his scraped palms, he started bellowing out words that I couldn't quite make out. I pulled my jacket around me, and then he tried talking to me and he came in garbled whispers as the road ahead turned into a blur of lines and mile markers. You'll meet an end too. It's a setup. Tommy says hi. Seeing my bottom lip tremble in the reflection forced me to bite it shut. Night drew on and the man could no longer be seen in the windshield, but I refused to stop and regain control of my anxious breath. Shaking, I had put it out of my mind as far as it would go. The black night through Oklahoma fared no better. As I drove on and the cars thinned out, I could see him standing by the side of each mile marker, mouth moving in words and never to be heard. Time became infinitesimal, incalculable, no coherency could be managed on that foreboding interstate, as the headlights blared and I ceased to exist as a full person understanding the world. There was only the steering wheel in front of me as I urged the rig to take me on. I wished that I were done with the task and in Maine already, but I had so many hours to go. There would be no sleep until I died, of that much I was certain. In actuality, I would have probably been fine if I had pulled off somewhere to recharge. So many odd happenings came to pass that I no longer wanted to stop. In my deprived mind, I could only think of pushing on, and so I did. Blinking slow through throbs of sleep, I found myself slipping. The mile markers and no haunting man in sight whizzed by, and the signs scrambled to indecipherable gibberish against the backdrop of a starless horizon. Still, the freeway was wide and safe and among others. And trying to give my mind something to do, I began singing along to the CD that I had playing. Dear Abby, dear Abby, my feet are too long. But this proved to be no better than my jaw remaining motionless. I shut the radio off and then came a great big yawn that forced me to squint through a kaleidoscopic tears. And by the time that it passed, I was confronted with something that woke me up so completely that I straightened myself in the chair and gripped the steering wheel with wide confusion. The road ahead was no longer the interstate, but a narrow, crooked road with foreign trees clawing at the trailer. Angled crooked fingers forcing a twist in my stomach. Swallowing hard, my eyes darted to the fuel gauge. Plenty left, but no idea where I was. The GPS map spun in erratic jerks recalculating. I shut the useless thing off. Rationalizing away my superstition, I came up with any number of reasons that I might be on what had to be a back road. But each one dissipated with the thump of my front right tire hitting a pothole. The sound of crickets among the trees, as rocks kicked underneath the cab, reminded me how alone I was. The road, never ending as it was, snaked through deep forest. Only one thought sprang to mind. This was how I died. The setup had finally caught up to me. Within that hushed insanity, I hoped and prayed that light would find me just around the next bend, but it never did. Instead, when I did see light next, it came from the rear view in the form of a pair of high beams from a pickup truck. Breathing a sigh of relief, I watched as the lights behind gained speed. I wasn't so alone after all. And then the sound of metal on metal came and alienation rocked back to me. The truck crashed into me, swaying the trailer. My tires slid as I fought to regain control and stay on the road. What the heck are they doing? I kept them in view as well as I could through the rear view. The CB choked alive, stopping my heart short of beating. We guard the roads and have found you a hazard. I jerked the receiver to my mouth, certain that the person on the other end of the line was the one trying to run me off the road. What are you doing? Are you crazy? Another slam at my back end. Come on, I screamed. Will you or will you miss it? 
A tire dipped off the road and I almost overcorrected. The thrum of the engine, the lights, the snaking darkness ahead, and the trees combined to make a perfect tunnel vision of hell. Back off. And then an idea sprang to mind. I eased the brakes. Another slam came and I felt the trailer shift. It was not long until I was nearing a full stop. As they did too, a new thought came. What if they were trying to board the rig? What was I to do then? I twisted the engine off, yanked the keys from the ignition, and locked the doors before diving towards the rear of the cab where personal effects were scattered across the bed. I scanned the vicinity for something big, something that I could whack somebody with. I should have invested in that gun that I thought about years prior. Pivoting to face the front of the cabin from what I hoped was the relative safety of the darkness, I squeezed the keys between my fingers. It was hardly a weapon, but I would use them if I needed to. I watched through the small window at the head of the bed. Black shadows moved across it. In a single file line, they marched by in an approximate silhouettes. Cold swept through the cab. Even without appropriate light, I could see my own breath mist in front of my face. Something was very wrong. They weren't making any noise. I craned forward to catch a glimpse of them standing in front of the engine. There they were, too many to have piled into that pickup truck. No way. Shrouded in shadow, they circled the front of the rig, interlocking arms like they were cut from black paper and strung across that way. Teeth clenched, I waited. Could they see me? Should I have run off into those trees? A whisper rose in the air. At first, I was certain that it came from the CB, but it didn't. It was as though the speaker was standing directly next to me. We watch you and those like you. We are the guardians of the road. Such transgressions cannot be overlooked. You must be punished. My blood ran cold. What the heck does that mean? Speaking to the disembodied voice was peculiar and I waited for a response as the cabin fell quiet once more, all the while feeling like a ginormous idiot. The shrouded figures merely stood outside. I relaxed my fist of keys and jumped into the seat, cranking the rig on. Headlights splashed across their disfigured and inhuman faces. My heart sank into the chair and I was frozen in equal measures of dismay, sadness, and horror. Twisted curiosities and without clothes. There they stood, arms together, blocking my path. I honked the horn once and then pushed the gas with a quick tap, lurching forward. Come on, come on, move. They stood stalwart in their demeanor without flinching or acknowledging the rig's front bumper. I pushed on, surely they would move. They did not. I watched as they disappeared beneath the edge of the hood and I could feel the slightest of rocks as I went over them. Move, man, I screamed. Why didn't you move? Hot tears rolled down my face. I blinked. There I was on the interstate again. White knuckles stood out like mountains in front of me. I shook all over. It was normal. I was fine. I pulled off on the next exit and parked quickly at a stop. Resting my head on the wheel, I felt sick, woozy. Fresh air might help, I thought. I removed myself from the cab and put my hands over my head to better breathe. There, just around the left wheel, I caught sight of a red smear. In a panic, I ran to the rear of the trailer, and there along the corners and edges were noticeable dents. After washing the blood, I took to dreaming that was hardly that at all. Somewhere between Bourbon and Sullivan in Missouri is where the wild things are. To keep my eyes open, I started on caffeine tablets, thinking that they would keep my tired mind sharp was ridiculous. But the images in my dreams were far from my control and I didn't want to sleep. Instead, the world went in a haze of wild colors and motions and sounds. There came a time where muscle memory alone was the only thing tending the wheel. That scares me. Things would never be normal again. If there are souls tethered between here and the next place, I resided among them in that fever dream. Catching my reflection forced to frown. Who was that man with the bruises beneath his eyes? 
Why hadn't he shaved? Surely that man was not me. More than once I thought of ditching the trailer in the next town somewhere and heading home. That would have been the best. I could dust my hands of the whole affair and disappear. It was the only viable option. But it wasn't like I would have anyone to go back to. I would just be as lonely there as I would be out on the road. So, what did it even matter? Time meant nothing as it seemed that gray clouds followed me, blotting out the bright blue sky and making it so that I lived in a world of hurt. A world where I never could tell if it was daytime or night. It all felt black. Unbodied voices incessantly whispered through the CB whether it was on or not, and shadow people spilled from every corner. I rolled by a minivan full of children in soccer uniforms and upon waving at their smiling faces and giving them a hug, I saw that the person driving the van was blacked out. Just the fuzziest outline of what should have been a human. But that shape had eyes that made me uncomfortable. Bulbous, white, and veiny red. It felt like I was finally seeing the world for what it was. The reality beneath the surface of what we understand. There I was, riding metal into dark space, into the edges of understanding. The hitchhiker sat in the passenger seat with his feet on the dash. Oh, please don't do that. I begged without making eye contact. I did not like looking at him because there was certainly no way that he was real. He tugged the seatbelt wrapped around his throat as though it was a tightly lapped scarf. Does it look like I'm worried about safety regulations? My shoulders slumped as my fingers dangled off the wheel. Why are you here? You're all by yourself. Well, that's the way I like it. Seems like it's been working out for you, huh? He said. I cut my eyes to him as he idly pulled a piece of broken glass from his cheek, and black sludge oozed off his jaw, staining the floor. I felt sick. Please go away. Nah. Why are you here? Do you know what cortisol is? No. He shook his head. It's a hormone. Your cortisol's freaking whack. Only the hum of the engine could be heard as the yellow lines darted beneath the hood. Do you have any idea what you're doing? Not a clue. I blinked each eye individually. I don't feel very well. Any idea what you're moving? The hitchhiker thumbed back towards the trailer. I shook my head. Idiot. I felt movement from the trailer. I could hear it in my soul in the recesses of my reptile brain, vibrating the minuscule hairs on my ears. The hitchhiker laughed. You noticed that, huh? He squinted, nodded, and dissipated into mist and then nothing at all. And I was alone, but not quite by myself. I felt the trailer rock gently once more through whatever divine means and saw a long black limb that could have been mistaken for a tree branch creep from the top of the windshield. It came down in a wavery motion before it was joined by another. My heart shot into my throat like a carnival strength game. They were spider legs. Massive spider legs. The points crept towards the edges of the hood. In stunning detail, the mandibles of the creatures exhausted the air for me until I was certain that I was in space. Somewhere else. Such a ridiculous reaction it was, but I turned on the wipers and I sprayed. The spider hardly noticed. With my eyes peering through the spaces between its legs, I tried keeping my eyes on the road. Somehow I managed. The next exit found me throttling through it and I slammed on the brakes as I came to my first stop sign. Still the things maintained its grasp on the rig. I pulled into the nearest station and the massive spider stretched its legs. Without thought, only the need to get away from it. I pushed the driver's door open and I slung myself out, running from the cab. Bolting across the parking lot, passers-by shot me strange looks but I paid them no mind. As I reached the station's door, I wagered a glance over my shoulder. Nothing was on my rig, nothing at all. I had lost my mind, of course. Heart still beating, I crossed the parking lot toward my rig, 
fist clenched, teeth grinding. After rounding the front of the engine several times, examining my surroundings in a thousand crusty blinks, I took a deep breath. And that's when I saw the spider legs again. They came from the sky and reached down to consume my vision, and then it dawned on me. The spider had not been a giant creature. It was on my face. I screamed and swatted at my brow. The spider, roughly the size of my hand, smacked the ground on its back. I slammed a foot on it and hunkered down while putting my face in my hands. There's something wrong with me. There's something wrong with everything. I had been too tired to feel it on my face and my delusional mind wasn't seeing things right. Hey there, cowboy. I looked up to see a man, while well, mostly a man, standing over me with his hands on his hips. He wore a badge, but his face was like that of the driver I had seen in the minivan. He looked like he had been cut from deep black absence. Officer, I nodded at him. You're right. His lidless eyes ran along his face like fried eggs, drooping where his mouth should have been. I'm fine. I tried averting my gaze to the ground as I stood. Tired? He asked. Sure. Yeah, my daddy was a trucker. I get how it is, but you should get some sleep. You were swerving back there. I nearly pulled you over. But figured I'd give you a warning. Get some sleep, cowboy. His bulging eyeball rolled clean off his face and slapped the ground. I shivered and took in a great deal of air while looking at it and restraining my gag reflex. Oh, will do, sir. He turned to walk away but stopped and pivoted to look back at me before going back to his car. You know, spiders lay eggs. Why would you say that to me? Have a good sleep, cowboy. He tipped his hat and left me standing there in awe. I don't know what to think anymore. I think I'm done with this. I don't want to go any further and I don't know what to do. Maybe I'll just shut my eyes like the officer said and slowly drift off into the void.